ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome and, and Falcher. Welcome to our online commemoration event to mark the 93rd anniversary of the departure from Baldonnell of the Junkers W33 Bremen registration D1167, uh, which on the 12th and 13th of April 1928 made the first successful non-stop flight across the North Atlantic from east to west by a heavier than air machine. This commemoration is hosted this evening by the Colonel James Fitzmaurice Commemoration Society, which is based in Port Leash. This evening, we remember the flight itself, as well as focusing on Colonel Fitzmaurice, the early years and his association with Port Leash. The 12th of April is a famous day in aviation history and in space history, as you may have seen in the news this weekend with the launch of another manned space mission to the International Space Station to coincide with the 12th of April, 1961 when Yuri Gagarin was the first man in space and who is fated as such today. We would argue that the crew of the Bremen were the Gagarins of their era in the accomplishment that they achieved in conquering the Atlantic, across, crossing from east to west for the first time. More about this later. First and foremost, we have some housekeeping issues to mention. Number one, please mute your microphone so that the speaker and the video clips are clearer to all the audience. Number two, it will help the video quality and experience as well if you switch off your camera while video clips are playing. It may also help to adjust your volume upwards while video clips are playing and down when then for the speakers. Hopefully these tips will result in a more pleasant viewing experience. If you want to make a comment or ask a question, please use the chat function in Zoom and we will get to you during the Q&A segment at the end. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you can submit questions on Facebook and we will address them to at the Q&A session at the end of the evening's presentation. We will email all the event by participants with a link to the Google Share Drive with copies of the clips and presentations if you want to replay them later if the quality doesn't come across. During the presentations this evening, we will use various clips from ver previous productions on the Bremen Fitzmaurice uh, project. We would like to acknowledge and thank both Tim Costello for his great productions from 1978 and 1998 and to Brendan DC and his son Louis DC for their excellent production created for the 90th anniversary proceedings here in Leash in 2018. We will conclude, conclude proceedings this evening with a fantastic piece of music and video from Music Generation Leash, composed especially for the Fitzmaurice project during COVID restrictions. It really encaps encapsulates the man and the flight and the impossible dream. At this point, I would like to introduce our first speaker for the evening, Mr. Teddy Fenley who is the chairperson of the Colonel James Fitzmaurice Commemoration Society and is a passionate advocate for the Fitzmaurice Bremen project. Teddy is the author of the Fitzmaurice's, bi of Fitzmaurice's biography called Fitz and the Famous Flight, published in 1997, as well as many other publications related to Leash heritage. Teddy is a former owner and editor of the Leinster Express newspaper here in Port Leash and has many other interests, including GA, golf, and most other sports. Before Teddy addresses you all, we would like to play an excerpt from Tim's, uh, Tim Costello's documentary showing the Bremen takeoff from Baldonnell.
Thanks, Alan. Good evening to all our guests. Good evening to our German guests. It's wonderful to see such a large turnout. A full house indeed to mark the 93rd anniversary of the first East to West transatlantic flight in 1928. As you are probably aware, we had to change Zoom platforms to cater for the overflow. We had hoped to mark the event with some planes in the air and boots on the ground. That was not possible, but I do hope you enjoy our virtual presentation. The Colonel Fitzmaurice Commemoration Society honours the memory and achievements of Ireland's foremost aviation pioneers. Colonel Fitzmaurice grew up and was educated in Port Leash, then a relatively small community of a few thousand people, and now one of Ireland's most progressive and fastest growing towns. We have a beautiful bronze bust of Fitzmaurice in the foyer of Leash County Hall here in Port Leash, and a public area in the centre of the town now bears his name. Our society has marked the anniversary of the Bremen flight for a number of years and we intend to, con to continue to do so every year until the centenary in 2028, which should be a major event. We will do so in partnership with other interested parties, particularly the Irish Air Corps, with which the Bremen flight has such huge significance, as well as our friends in the city of Bremen, with whom we have built up a firm relationship in recent years. The flight of the Bremen is worthy of celebration. We know that most aviation people of the day, including Charles Lindbergh himself, who had flown the Atlantic from the American side in 1927, believed flying the Atlantic in a more difficult direction from east to west was impossible with the type of aircraft and technology then available. It was the impossible dream. The Atlantic was not conquered by air until it was flown in both directions. It was the biggest challenge for the pioneering aviators of the 1920s and one of the greatest challenges of all in the history of aviation. And that is what the intrepid crew of the Bremen, Captain Herman Cole, Baron von Hunfield, and the then Commandant James Fitzmaurice achieved. Yes, they accomplished the impossible dream of aviation. It caused a sensation somewhat similar to that of man's first landing on the moon in 1969. Such was its fascination with the people around the world. The distinguished Irish composer Martin Turish has composed a suite of music based on the life of Colonel James Fitzmaurice and the historic German-Irish flight of the Bremen. We will hear later from Martin and have a sample of his music uh, performed for the first time in public by Music Generation Leash on location at Lime Tree Airfield, courtesy of its proprietor, Jerry Deegan. Music Generation Leash are a wonderful group of musicians from different parts of Ireland and based in Port Leash under the direction of Rosa Flannery. Martin appropriately titles the piece the impossible dream. So that makes this evening extra special, I'm sure you will agree. We are delighted to have some other very distinguished guests on our show this evening. We have a message from the Brigadier General, Rory O'Connor, General Officer Commanding of the Irish Air Corps. I would like to thank him and all at the Irish Air Corps for all the help and cooperation given to our society over the years. The Air Corps are doing magnificent work in supporting the arms of state and working on behalf of the Irish people. And they are great ambassadors for our country on the international stage. Colonel Fitzmaurice, one of the first pilots to join the Irish Air Corps at the foundation of a newly independent Ireland in 1922. He was indeed officer in command at Baldonnell when co-pilot on the Bremen flight with his two brave German aviators, Captain Cole and Baron van Hunfield. I am sure that now as the Irish Air Corps prepare to celebrate the centenary of its founding next year, that one of its greatest leaders, Colonel James Fitzmaurice, would be very proud of them. The flight 
was a classic example of what can be achieved by international cooperation, which made an impossible dream become a reality. It is good then to have the German ambassador to Ireland, Her Excellency, Mrs. Dyke Potzell, with us from Dublin, as well as Dr. Bernd Hamaker and Dr. Jens Peterson, who join us from the city of Bremen. These two men played major roles in having the Bremen Monof plane repatriated from the United States to the city which gave it its name over 20 years ago. We can call them the safekeepers of the hallowed Junkers W-33 aircraft. I am sure that many of you who have joined us this evening will be pleased to know that the Aldrich Port Leisha monoplane, the first airplane to be built and take to the air in the Republic of Ireland, is now back in this country. It has been reconstructed faithfully and sympathetically by a, an expert uh, a restorer, Brendan O'Donoghue, with the help of his former Air Corps and Air Lingus colleague, Johnny Malloy, under the watchful eye of Tim Costello. My thanks to Leash County Council for providing temporary accommodation for the restored aircraft in a warehouse unit very near to the old Aldrich garage where the plane was constructed. The restored plane, along with other Bremen and Fitzmaurice aviation related artifacts and memorabilia, will be put on public display when the COVID-19 restrictions are lifted and when a suitable space is acquired. This is a very important artifact in the history of Irish aviation. More, more no, noteworthy still because James Fitzmaurice, as a schoolboy, helped the Aldrets and the master craftsman Johnny Conroy, also from Port Leash, in its construction. And it was in seeing that flimsy contraption take to the air that infused him with his lifelong passion for aviation. We will hear more about that this evening. There is also a collector's tribute by Liam Byrne and my Fitz friend of many years and a man well known in Irish aviation, Ralph James, will recount his solo flight to Green Lee Island in 1993. Before I conclude, I would like to introduce you to other members of our organising group. Vice Chairman, host and coordinator for tonight's event is Alan Phelan, who works in aviation and will speak on the Port Leash on a plane here. Our very efficient secretary is Louise Cahill, who lives in Greystones. Catherine Casey is our diligent and untiring Leash Heritage Officer and a supporter of the Fitzmaurice legacy. As also is Leash County Council indeed, its councillors and its senior officials. Sean Murray, hardworking chairperson of Leash Heritage Society and Regina Dunn, the Society's PRO, uh, have been firmly behind us all the way. Rosa Flannery of Music Generation Leash made it possible for the music composition to be commissioned. Michelle DeForge, our enlightened director of Dunamis Arts Theatre in Port Leash, helped us greatly, as did Tim Costello, former RTE producer and maker of documentaries on the Bremen flight. He was also involved in the Port Leash Plain Restoration Project. PJ Kavner, proprietor of one of the town's finest hostelries, chairman of downtown Port Leash, and also of Port Leash's outstanding Old Fort Festival. And last, by no means least, Michael Parsons, chairman of the National Heritage Council of Ireland, who will speak to us also a little later. Now, friends, sit back and enjoy our presentation. Thank you for that, Teddy. Uh, now uh, we travel to Baldonnell, County Dublin, where the Bremen took off on this day in 1928, and which is the home of the Irish Air Corps. We are delighted to have a special message from Baldonnell and to hear a unique part of the story now presented by Brigadier General Rory O'Connor. General Officer Commanding at the Irish Air Corps. Thanks are due to the Irish Air Corps Press Office for putting this clip together for this special occasion. Hello, thank you for joining me here in Caitlin Derodrome Ballon, home of the Irish Air Corps, for the 93rd anniversary of the Bremen flight, the first successful east-to-west non-stop conquering of the Atlantic Ocean 
by an airplane known as the Bremen. The Junkers W33 aircraft departed Ballon at 0538 hours on the 12th of April 1928 with two German crew members, Captain Hermann Kohl and Baron von Hunfeld, and an Irishman, Major James Fitzmaurice, the commander of the Irish Air Service. The pioneering Bremen and her crew arrived in Greenly Island, Canada after some 36 hours of struggle over the North Atlantic. However, tonight I would like to mention another passenger on that famous flight. Carried under the care of Major James Fitzmaurice was a tricolour pennant, our national flag, on Brotted North Schunter, or tricolour. This symbolises the inclusion and traditions of the people on this island. Today, I hold that very tricolour pennant that the then Chief of Staff, General Sean McGowan, handed to Major Fitzmaurice prior to take off. Major Fitzmaurice carried the pennant until his return to Ireland and presented it back to the Chief of Staff, General McGowan, and was kept in his family. This is the first tricolour to cross the Atlantic Ocean by air and now forms part of the Irish Air Corps Museum collection. Thank you again for joining me to celebrate this historic event that forms part of the fabric of our nation's incredible aviation heritage. And please enjoy the evening's presentations. Barely visible in the morning darkness were the red markers outlining the takeoff path. From each side of the cockpit fluttered two small flags. On the left, the black, white and red German imperial colours, and on the right, the tricolour of the Irish Air Corps, green, white and gold. Fitzmaurice was the last to climb the wing into the right-hand seat. He had been besieged with well-wishers, had a few private words with his wife, and received communion from Father Reardon, who also blessed the waiting plane. The flags were taken inside, the cockpit canopy was lowered, and tension mounted in the crowd that now surrounded the hangars under military control. Uh, as we all know, the Bremen flight would not have happened without a significant and crucial input from Germany. Tonight, we are honoured to have the German ambassador to Ireland, Her Excellency Mrs. Dijka Postel, here to mark the 93rd anniversary. Mrs. Postel, uh, would you care to say a few words to us this evening? Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. Yes, indeed. We Is that can. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Lovely. So, um, dear all, dear participants, dear viewers, um, dear members of the Liege Heritage Society, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's an honor to be here with you at the annual commemoration for the first successful non-stop east-west transatlantic flight and to celebrate, as it was said before, its 93rd anniversary. Um, I have to say I'm glad, though, that we did not meet at the exact time of the Bremen's takeoff, which was 538 GMT, as you all know. That would have been a bit too early for my taste, I have to say. Um, what an extraordinary endeavor to fly the more difficult and dangerous east-west direction shortly after Charles Lindbergh's, Lindbergh's successful solo flight the other way from New York to Paris. And uh, as uh, was alluded to, Lindbergh described the flight against the prevailing winds as the Everest of aviation and indeed impossible. So our three heroes spent 36 and a half hours of daring and brave adventure in the skies, which a lot had thought might end like others before in disaster. Luckily it didn't, and they were rightly hailed as heroes. But listening to some of the stories, it does seem incredible that they actually made it. Nowadays, except of course in COVID times, one boards a plane in Europe and takes it absolutely for granted that the crew will land the plane at exactly the intended destination, the United States, a few hours later. How different the flight of the Bremen was. It was an amazing, even daredevil adventure with no guaranteed success given the technical possibilities at the time. The airplane was much too heavy, also given the amount of oil they carried. And I love the story about them even peeling the oranges they wanted to take along to save weight, or the fact that they had to cut out an arm wrist last minute because they couldn't fit in the seat. It sounds pretty incredible, I have to say. They were relying to no small extent to the exceptional navigational skills of the Irish navigator and co-pilot, Major James Fitzmaurice. Back then, 30 years of age only, and yet already an experienced seasoned airman due to his Air Force service in World War II. One. 
And I have to say, I look in awe at the difficulties the crew encountered, not least a sheep crossing the runway during takeoff, um, a heavy Atlantic storm later on, as well as the famous oil leaking. A situation beyond words, as Fitzmaurice described it. Plus, it was intensely cold, something that would most certainly have put me off completely. The three brave aviators faced difficulties also in staying on course due to the clouds, but in the end, they landed, as we know, successfully on Green, the island in Canada. From a present day, thinking of GPS and SATNAV, a custom pers um, perspective, absolutely astounding. They were all healthy and in one piece, so to speak. Only the plane, the German built Bremen, suffered some damage and never made it to New York, unlike the crew. As we all know, it has been completely restored and is on display at the Bremen Airport Museum. And to all those who have not made it to Bremen yet, it's well worth a visit, post COVID, obviously. A beautiful Hansestadt where the three aviators were eternalized in a plate by German expressionist artist Bernhard Höttger in the very unique Böttcher Street. So as I am not an expert in aviation, for me, it is also a wonderful example for a successful German-Irish corporation. The German-Irish crew, or the three musketeers of the air, as they called themselves, made headlines. And in the words of Baron von Hunefeld, none of us ever regretted the pact, which proved itself trustworthy in the course of extreme danger. Noteworthy too, as the crew members had fought on opposite sides of World War I. Fitzmaurice therefore described, and I quote, the great progress that has been made in transforming aviation from a war weapon into a peace force, end of quote. And as some historians describe it, Fitzmaurice also helped the crew being welcomed so warmly in New York, as it would have probably been a different story if merely 10 years after the end of the war, two Germans, would have landed on their own. As ambassador um, of Germany to Ireland, I am happy to see yet another positive example of our shared history in this flight. And there are many other such examples, such as Adna Krusha, I'm sure you know, the Siemens power plant close to Limerick, or Nobel Literate Laureate's uh, Heinrich Böll's Irish Journal, which brought hundreds of thousands of Germans to Ireland. And I'm delighted about today's ever so close cooperation between Germany and Ireland. It was very welcome news when Tishov Varadka said in 2020 that Ireland's relations with Germany are better than ever before and are becoming even more important in an EU of 27 member states. And let me assure you that even during the pandemic, we cooperated extremely well to support each other. As we have just signed a so-called second joint plan of action of enhanced cooperation, I would want to use this opportunity to invite everyone with the interest in things German-Irish to join in and use the huge potential for our relations, be it economic, cultural, or political. Do not hesitate to get in touch if you want to engage. One or the other might even venture to learn our language or convince their children or grandchildren to do it. I can see that this uh, might take a bit of courage, but Whatever way you choose, the three musketeers of the air are a telling and inspiring example for me of the positivities um, of venturing to new horizons and to cooperation. So ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for having me and thank you wholeheartedly for keeping the memory of that um, important flight alive and for doing such an extraordinary work um, in doing so. Have a great evening and uh, all the very best. And as we say today um, regularly, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you for those kind words and for being with us here this evening. Now, next on the agenda, uh, we're going to return uh, to Fitz, the early years and his leash connections. So uh, I'm going to give a, a presentation about uh, the connections of Leash of Fitz, Fitzmaurice with, with Port Leash. And just give me a second while I share some slides.
Okay, um, fits the early years and the Portlaoise plane. Thank you again, ladies and gentlemen, for giving me the opportunity to bring to you the story of the connection between Colonel James Fitzmorris and the Aldred Garage um, in Portlaoise and his association with the Aldred monoplane, also known as the Portlaoise plane. This photograph taken in the summer of 2019 shows the plane with Chief Restorer Brendan O'Donoghue and Johnny Malai, along with, with Teddy Fenley and myself. Where it all began, as Teddy alluded to earlier, Fitz's passion for aviation was ignited in his formative years in Portlaoise when it happened one day in 1909 on his way home from the Christian Brothers School to step into Louis and Frank Aldrich's garage in what was then known as Marlborough. There is a good account of this encounter in Teddy's biography of Fitz, chapter two, called Aladdin's Cave. Fitz was enthralled to see that the, the Aldred brothers were in the process of assembling an airplane in their workshop in Marlborough. I just want to read a short extract from that book. To my youthful mind, the workshop was more wonderful than Aladdin's cave. From then onwards, I spent my every idle hour there and pottered about endeavoring to help, although in actual fact, it was probably just a little nuisance getting in everybody's way. He goes on to tell of the building of the airplane and of his youthful enthusiasm in the unusual and wonderful project. In this presentation, we explore Fitz's connection with the first airplane built and flown in what was to become the Republic of Ireland. What happened at uh, the airplane itself and where it is today. On a nostalgic visit back to Portlaoise in 1951, Fitz recalls his amazement at seeing the Portlaoise plane, quote, I saw it hanging from the old rafters, the bare wings and body of this ancient airplane that had first attracted me, like iron filings to a magnet to the baby world of aviation, then stirring feebly in swaddling clothes. The photograph here uh, is actually from the 1930s. And you can clearly see in the rafters, the wings of the plane and also the propeller on the wall on the right hand side. You can buy a tractor for 120 pounds or a Model T Ford for 155 pounds. To put it in context, when Fitz stumbled into Aldrich's garage, he was only 11 years of age. It was only six years since the Wright brothers' famous flight in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. It was the same year that Blairio crossed the English Channel and that Harry Ferguson first took to the air in Belfast, and another 10 years before the first Atlantic crossing by Alcock and Brown. As you can see in the timeline, another nine years would pass before the first east to west crossing of the Atlantic by Fitz and the crew of the Bremen the very reason why we are gathered here today. The Portlaoise plane is mentioned in several local publications of the time. Here is an extract from the GA notes of the Nationalists from August 1907, where the authors tongue in cheek proposed to use the Aldred flying machine to report on three games happening on a particular Sunday afternoon in August 1907 throughout County Leash. There is another mention in King's County Chronicle, published in Burr, formerly Parsonstown, in November 1909. You can see here that Ross Gray's sausages were still very popular at the time. It reads as follows, Queen's County to the fore. A few days ago, we alluded to the inventive skill of a Burr man in the field of aviation. In view of this, it will be of interest to note that during last week, two brothers, Louis and Frank Aldrich, engineers of Marlborough, have succeeded in the presence of some friends in covering a short distance in a small airplane. The brothers a year ago designed, design, designed a motor car, which is a triumph of mechanical skill. The young men possess a high de degree of mechanical skill and have refused offers from firms across the channel owing to a love of their native town. And finally, in Fitzmaurice's own words, this wonderful creation slowly took shape and soon my extremely limited vocabulary became considerably enhanced by such high sounding technical words as lingerons, fuselage, empennage and aerolons. I felt exceedingly highbrow and more than elated to be allowed to consort with such grand company. It was a labor of love and was finally completed. With great ceremony, it was wheeled to the largest meadow in the vicinity, the heat. The little motor was started as it stood poised, head into wind, for that impatiently waited moment to take off. Never before had the inhabitants of our small town reached such a fever pitch of excitement. Slowly gathered, gathering momentum, the little machine hurtled across the meadow. 
Unfortunately, the aircraft did not stay airborne for long, as the center of gravity was a little too far forward and the aircraft suffered a very hard landing shortly after takeoff. Despite its short-lived life, the design of the altered aircraft and its ability to fly was sufficiently interesting and important that it was the subject of and recently analyzed by a postgraduate student at Queen's University, Belfast. In his analysis, Brian Chow concluded that the center of gravity was in fact in the wrong position, slightly forward, and hence the unstable nature of the aircraft on its flight attempt. Using the simulator and modern computer software, Brian was able to relocate the center of gravity and make a successful flight of the Portage plane in the Queen's University uh, Belfast Merlin flight simulator. On these uh, photos, you can see the simulator inside and out. You can see an image of the Portage plane as it was designed in the simulator. And there's a picture of Brendan and uh, Brian here uh, on one of his visits to Enfield during his uh, project. And now, are you ready for takeoff? This is the flight simulator recording after the CEO center of gravity was adjusted. You can imagine here that you are in a pilot of the Port Leash plane taking off from the heat just outside of Port Leash. Or in fact, we could be taking off from line three air feet is right beside the heat. So the flight, or the, the, flight, the flight simulator reenactment uh, did a successful takeoff circle of the airport here. And I just wind it on a little bit here. Comes back into land on the same slip. Without any hard landing, it has to be said. So we're landing here now on the first fairway on the Heat Golf Club. And we're down. Okay, the Aldrich monoplane gets various mentions in publications down the years, from British aircraft before the Great War, to a view from above by Donald McCarran, to Pioneers, Showmen and the Royal Flying Corps by Guy Warner. I'm just going to read a short extract there, uh, as you can see. In 1912, at his garage in Portlaoise, known in colonial times as Marlborough, a Mr. Aldrich built a monoplane and took to the air while his wife gazed on, terror-stricken at his antics. A young local lad, when not under the tutelage of the Christian brothers, had assisted in the construction of the plane. He was James Fitzmaurice, and this experience sparked off an enorm enormous enthusiasm, for, enthusiasm in him for aviation. The plane also gets a mention in Flight International in 1967, titled Relic in the Roof. And in 1969, it is of such historical significance that Captain Kelly Rogers from Erlingus pleaded with Donny Aldred that the plane should be donated to the Aviation Museum that was to be constructed soon at Dublin Airport. This was the last mention of the Portlaoise plane for over 40 years. It was forgotten about and disappeared from Portlaoise. Some claimed it made its way to Dennis Lucy's motor car museum in Killarney. Others claimed it was sold to a collector in the UK in the 1970s. It was not until an article published in 2013 by a former Portlaoise native now living in Liverpool, that the mystery was solved. Joe Rogers, who happens to be on the call this evening, I believe. How are you, Joe? Nice to have you here. His father was instrumental in the construction of the original plane. He was on holidays in the south coast of England when he got a tour of the Filching Manor Motor Museum, where in one of the far-flung corners of the complex, he rediscovered the Portlaoise plane. He learned that it was acquired by the current owner's father, Carl Fuchs Halbar, back in the 1970s, as he toured Ireland looking for vintage motor cars to add to his collection. He had great plans to restore the plane to its original glory and display it, but other projects took priorities over the years. Here's where the museum is located, as you can see. It's in the summer of 2018, both Teddy Fenley and myself 
flew to London and traveled by car to Eastbourne to meet with Mr. Paul Halbard and to witness the plane for ourselves. To be fair to the Halbards, they did look after the plane really well and treated it with preservative annually. Teddy built up a good rapport with Carl and eventually persuaded him to sell the aircraft after several visits and that the plane should be returned to its rightful home back in Ireland. Here you can see it hanging in the rafters after 50 years. And here you can see the wing spars constructed from bamboo poles that were sourced in the Coote family estate in Ballyfin which is later in later years with Ballyfin College and is now Ballyfin Hotel. Also visible on the right hand side is the cockpit and the bucket seat used by the pilot. In December 2018, both, Teddy Fen both John Fenley, Teddy's son and myself made one final return journey to Filching Manor to transport the aircraft back to Leash. The event was recorded by Portage photographer Terry Conroy who accompanied us on the trip. We were very lucky to have the expertise of Eastway Logistics from Limerick whose owner, Frank McNamara, kindly provided an air ride transportation truck to handle the delicate cargo once again across the Irish Sea. This is the fuselage being loaded onto the truck. Back in Dublin in January 2019, we gathered some aviation enthusiasts and local leash dignitaries to view the plane back on Irish soil. Here is a group of enthusiasts who gathered on a cold January morning in Dunabate. Looking pretty bleak at this stage, as you can see, laid out in, in the warehouse in, Dunib in Dunabate. The original wing structure as laid out. The intricate woodwork shown here is testament to the highly skilled local artisan and carpenter called Johnny Conroy, who worked with the Aldrets in the construction of the plane. The discussion about restoration begins. Here we see Brendan O'Donoghue, Johnny Malloy and Eamon Cullerton deep in discussion. Teddy and myself were extremely lucky to discover that two of the preeminent aircraft restorers in Ireland were willing to assist with the aircraft restoration. But Brendan O'Donoghue and Johnny Malloy, both ex Air Corps and Aer Lingus men respectively, had already worked uh, together on the restoration of the original Aer Lingus plane, the other. The Portage plane was relocated to Brendan's workshop, where, under the, rest where the restoration would commence under the watchful eye and pro uh, of project manager Tim Costello, who we mentioned previously. The team was completed with the addition of a gifted engineer and craftsman from Emo, County Leash, called John Harris. John was instrumental in getting the undercarriage support and wheels remanufactured. As you can see in the photographs, we had some reference material to work on. The design of the, and construction of the Blario plane outlined in the Aero Manual 1910 was a guide for us. As the original engine and propeller were not, no longer available, a plan was hatched to come up with replicas as close as possible to that described in Teddy's Aladdin's Cave mentioned earlier. The engine was described as a three cylinder inline water cooled engine cast in Dublin by Tonjan Taggart and with a forged crank from r &E Hall of Salford fitted with a Bosch Magneto. Based on this and using the Wright Brothers engine design as a guideline, theirs was a four cylinder inline model. We set about designing and remodeling a replica engine. Tim Costello was instrumental in this process and in finding a craftsman who was expert in engine restoration, namely Kip Lankenau of Kip Motor Company in Dallas, Texas. Regarding the propeller, Brendan O'Donoghue has sourced a replacement in line with the original as seen in the Aldrich garage photograph shown earlier. There's an update from Kip there, I just mentioned in the bottom left. We're currently welding the crankcase together and once that's done, it should be only, only take a week or so to finish aging and assembly. This is an update on the 7th of April to 2021 from Dallas. Here are Johnny and Brendan at work. Some of the finer details shown and Tim is in conversation with Brendan on the replica engine and propeller solutions. My wife Anita had the honor of being the first person to sit in the cockpit of the Portage plane in over 110 years. An aerial view of the Portage plane. Some of the detailed pieces now varnished. Teddy, Brendan and Tim pose here with the wing structure. And finally, Just one second, waiting for the slides to catch up. Yeah, finally, Teddy, Brendan and Tim later in the year showing some of the varnishing work accomplished. 
At this point, I would like to play a short clip of a fireside chat uh, that I held with Tim Costello in his home last week to discuss his involvement with Fitz and the Port Leash plane. Tim is a qualified mechanical engineer and a former RTT, RTE executive who wrote and produced two preeminent RTE documentaries on Fitz, one in 1978 for the 50th anniversary and one in 1998 for the 70th anniversary. These productions included some rare black and white footage of the takeoff in Belldonnell and of the celebrations after the flight in New York, which we've sh shown here tonight, courtesy of Tim. Let's hear from the man himself. Tell me, how did your involvement and interest with Fitz and the Aldred monoplane come about? Well, it's, it's very hard to remember back that far because uh, the first thing I heard about it was uh, Teddy Fennelly. So it was a, uh, the editor of a newspaper in, in Port Leash. And uh, he, he appeared at my doorstep one day, wondering that he had, had I got any you know, photographs or documents about Colonel Fitzmaurice because he was going to start writing a book. That was the start of that. Right. Okay. Interesting. Okay, so Teddy, yourself and Teddy got connected and worked together on the Fitzmaurice project over the years. And uh, the two documentaries that you made are seminal pieces of work. And uh, I actually looked at the recordings myself the last few days. Um, the one from 1978 is fantastic. Uh, uh, um, the Captain Darby in it and uh, the old black and white footage. The one from 1978 is excellent as well. And maybe the audience here might like to see those at some point in the future. But after that, you got involved with Teddy in the Portage Plain restoration project, and you were instrumental with Brendan O'Donoghue in helping the restoration project as project manager. What would you say was one of the um, most intriguing parts of the restoration project? project? Well, uh, the, the, the highlight of my life was uh, meeting, meeting uh, Teddy Fennelly in the first place because we immediately started swapping information and photographs with each other, documents and all sorts of things. And, and it's amazing. Well, in, in connection with the plane itself and the restoration, what would have been the highlight? The highlight would, would be uh, when, I just, when I became a friend of uh, Brendan O'Donoghue and he, he was the guy who who repaired that airplane and made long, long splices to, to prove it. The white wood was the spliced one and the, the, the brown wood was the kind of less than perfect wood, let us say. But uh, we, we kept giving each other hints and tips about, oh, this should be going there and that should be going here and so on. But it was completely, thoroughly enjoyable. And I'm continuing with that, supplying things like the, uh, the uh, the, the instruments for the, yeah. the cockpit. And uh, you, were, you, were, you were instrumental always, also, pardon the pun, in getting the replica engine uh, project going with uh, Kip Langenau in Dallas. Yeah, well, of course, the engine was the highlight of the, the whole operation, I think, because uh, uh, in, in, a, in a former life, uh, I was a mechanical engineer, and uh, I loved anything to do with engines in particular. And when I got the chance to actually design the engine for the aircraft, uh, the Aldred aircraft, I was so delighted as you couldn't believe. And so that, that engine that's about to make its appearance in Ireland for the first time. Excellent. Uh, no, no, we're look, really looking forward to that. And um, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, the plane is, is coming together as we've seen in the pre previous presentation. And uh, uh, we love to see the engine, the airplane, the wings, all aspects of it back in Port Leash very soon. And really, without your help, it wouldn't have happened. Okay, folks, so um, just to conclude then on the Port Leash plane, final destination, question mark. The current status of the restoration project is as follows. Due to COVID restrictions, the final assembly and return to Port Leach has been delayed by several months. It, has been, it had been planned to have the plane back for an unveiling ceremony in the newly restored Fitzmaurice Place on Saturday the 10th of April with an open air display to coincide with the Bremen Fitzmaurice annual event. 
Instead, we're giving you this virtual update today and we plan to host a real live event later in the summer, hopefully in August, to coincide with Heritage Week. The Colonel Fitzmaurice Commemoration Society hopes to find a permanent home for the Portage Plain in Portage. A temporary location has been kindly offered by Leash County Council. Ideally, we would like to see it in a location on display to the public to be seen along with other Fitz memorabilia and media explaining the story. We hope to see you all again during National Heritage Week in August 2021, when we hope to display the Portage Plain COVID restrictions permitting. Perhaps we'll have another fly pass like what uh, the Irish Historic Flight Foundation uh, did for us in 2018, you can see in the picture here. In the meantime, we'd love for you to keep in touch. You can message us on Twitter at Portage Plain and portageplain at gmail.com. Anyone who registered on Eventbrite for this evening's event uh, will get a, an update via email. Finally, I'd like to thank Louise Carl for her help with the presentation. And uh, on that note, we'll move back to the uh, main agenda again. Okay, so um, next we have a presentation uh, from another passionate supporter of the Bremen and Fitzmaurice story. Liam Byrne is an archivist and collector of ephemera, including postcards and stamps and other collectible items. He has an incredible special collection of items to do with Fitzmaurice and the Bremen flight. We hope to display these during Heritage Week later this year, COVID restrictions permitted. Here is a collection, a collector's tribute to Colonel Fitzmaurice and the Bremen. Good evening. My name is Liam Byrne. I collected paper ephemera, illustrated first day and souvenir postal covers and small collectibles for many years. And one of my interests is the Irish aviator James Fitzmaurice and the flight of the Bremen in 1928. I collect contemporary material from the 1920s and 30s and commemorative material from later years. This is my tribute to James Fitzmaurice archive as it currently stands, comprising 114 pages with 180 individual items. Tonight, we will take a look at just some of the items focusing on material from the time of the flight, 93 years ago today. The Bremen flew from Baldonnell to Greenlee Island on the 12th and 13th of April, 1928. When the crew eventually reached New York, they were fated as heroes. On the right is a postcard produced in America in their honor. The reverse of the card at the bottom conveys the excitement in New York City when the aviators arrived. Harry, the author, writing to Dick in Germany, says, Here is a very good picture of the aviators. I have been in the lower part of the city, near City Hall, and was participating in the welcome reception. It was so great, hard to describe. There is only one city in the world where such gorgeous events can happen, New York, the city spent $65,000 for the reception, with 10,000 soldiers, music, and thousands of policemen. The crowd was awful, and the ambulances were very busy. Three musical pieces were written in 1928 to commemorate the flight. I currently have two of them. They landed over here from over there by, Joe, by Kennedy and O'Donovan, Shapiro, Bernstein and Co., New York, and Skybirds, by August Joseph Cole, an uncle of Herman Cole, the Bremen pilot, Jack Mills, Inc., New York. Of course, a fourth piece, The Impossible Dream by Martin Turish, performed by members of Music Generation Leash Trad Orchestra, is being launched here tonight, and I hope to add that score to my collection in due course. Eight receptions were held in New York in their honor, and two more on the Columbus, the ship on which they returned to Europe. These are two banquet programs from New York, from the Mayor's Banquet on the 26th of April on the right, signed by the three aviators, and a membership luncheon hosted by the Advertising Club on the 4th of May on the left. 
Collector's cards were invented in 1879, and by the second decade of the 20th century, they were very popular with both children and adults. On the right are examples of some cigarette cards and other collector's cards produced in Europe in the years following the flight. On the left are some of the celluloid pins produced, mostly by Whitehead and Hogue in New Jersey. Pins can be found with American, German and Irish flags, and occasionally with small pewter aeroplanes attached. In 1919, James Fitzmaurice flew with 110 Squadron RAF and delivered airmail from Folkestone in UK to Cologne in Germany. On the 14th of May that year, he was co-pilot navigator on the first experimental night airmail service from England to Europe. He mentions in the Three Musketeers of the Air how important he believes airmail from Europe to America will be. Therefore, he must have been pleased to see during the Goodwill tour that souvenir airmail covers were a regular feature of the celebrations. Covers exist for 11 cities. These examples are from Boston and New York. The US Post Office Department helped create the aviation industry in the US between 1918 and 1927 flying the nation's airmail service. Even after it was handed over to private commercial pilots, some carriers made 95% of their revenue from carrying the mails. Here are three more flown covers from the Goodwill Tour. These are from Chicago, Detroit and Montreal. Covers also exist from Philadelphia, Cleveland, Milwaukee, St. Louis, Albany and Quebec. By airmail to Europe. This souvenir postcard, one version in English and one in German, was produced for the visit to Milwaukee, the most German city in America, on the 13th 14th of May. Quite a few of them were sent by airmail to Europe. But while airmail was standard service in America since 1918, airmail to Europe by Graf Zeppelin didn't begin until September 1928, and regular transatlantic airmail services by aeroplane had to wait another decade, until 1939. At the time, airmail meant that some part of the route was by air, and this could have been the original flight from Milwaukee to New York, and, or, as in the case of the bottom card, within Europe. European airmail services had existed since 1915, and this card has a German airmail cache in red. The aviators returned to Europe on the Columbus and arrived in Bremerhaven on the 18th of June. The card on the left shows the scene of their arrival with UDET U-12 Flamingos doing an overhead fly past in their honour. I don't usually collect photographs, but I couldn't pass up on these original snapshots taken in Bremen the same day. The images show the streets of the city decked in the colours of Germany, the US and Ireland and one photo shows the flamingos that flew over to Columbus as she docked in Bremerhaven. While flown postal covers were the souvenir of choice in the US, in Germany real photo postcards were the norm. The flight was seen as so important that people sent these cards to their friends, describing the famous events that they witnessed. Here are three postcards sold during the flyer's visit to Berlin and Munich on the left, and two cards on the right for general distribution, the lower card possibly dating to the late 1930s. In Germany, the aviators were entertained just as well as they had been in New York. These are two menus from a gentleman's evening in the Imperial Hall of the Zoological Gardens in Berlin on the 22nd of June and a breakfast by the Bavarian Aero Club in Sternberg on the 29th of June. Unlike the American leg of their journey, I don't know how many dinners were held in their honour in Germany, so I don't know how many different menus might exist there. During their time in New York, the aviators had been treated to a luncheon by the Advertising Club of New York on the 4th of May. Here on the left are two contemporary advertising cards from Germany. One from Electrolux, the vacuum cleaner company that paid $12,000 for the honour of having one of their vacuum cleaners carried on the flight. And the other from BV Benzo, who
whose product comprised 40% of the fuel of the Bremen, the remainder being gasoline. Also shown is one of the many booklets, pamphlets and programmes produced at the time, and another postcard, this one more unusual, in colour. Brady, Crane and Colleran was a New York-based construction company who bought land in Nesapacua in Nassau County, New York, and started to build a hamlet there in 1928. One of their advertising gimmicks was the presence of an airfield within the development, which was to be called Fitzmaurice Field. The field was opened in 1929, and these are three souvenir covers from the event, one of which is signed by Fitzmaurice. The airfield closed in 1953. The photo on the right is of the Irish swoop, but that story from 1934 would take too long to relay to you tonight. That concludes my presentation. I would like to thank the organising committee for giving me the opportunity to present it to you. I hope you enjoyed the show and thank you for your company. Okay, um, thank you Liam for sharing that with us. I know Liam is online as well and uh, I hope uh, we gave him justice there. You will be able to see the originals, uh, hopefully in Heritage Week uh, later this year. Another fascinating insight into this inspiring story. I would now like to call on and introduce our next speaker, Mr. Michael Parsons. Michael is the chairperson of the Heritage Council of Ireland and we welcome their participation in this evening's event. Michael, are you uh, good to go? I am indeed, thanks Alan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the flight of the Bremen is a legendary part of the story of international aviation. People in Ireland and Germany are rightly proud of the achievements of the crew of the Bremen two Germans and an Irishman in their trailblazing and deeply courageous flight across the Atlantic Ocean in 1928. Naturally, in Ireland, we particularly cherish the uh, dashing and enterprising James Fitzmaurice, who was such a pioneer in the field of aviation. His compelling story and that of his two German companions, Captain Cole and Baron von Hunfeld, is one of great bravery, daring do and enterprise. Taking their lives in their hands, they were the first airmen to successfully fly from Ireland to America in 1928. The scientific opinions at that time, with that level of technology, said it couldn't be done, especially because of prevailing winds uh, and an east flight, east-west flight would be impossible. The riveting story of exploration, bravery, and against all odds, a successful outcome uh, led to the opening up of international commercial aviation between the old world and the new. Of course, the heroes were feted and praised both in Europe and America. Many years before the astronauts, they were honored by a ticker tape parade down Broadway in New York. An interesting aspect of the story uh, you've heard of it earlier is how Fitzmaurice is a schoolboy in Port Leash, helped in the construction of the Port Leash plane built and flown in the early 1900s, one of the first planes in the history of Irish aviation. But back to the flight of the Bremen. Today we celebrate a story that resonates at local, national and indeed international level. This is part of our heritage of which we can be so proud and glad also to share it with our friends in Germany. The achievements of those brave airmen echoes down through the years and reminds us all of the visionary and courageous aviators who helped make our world a better place. Their story is part of our shared heritage, providing inspiration for all who follow them. And I'd now like to introduce a short clip showing the celebrations for the airmen in New York, Bremen and Dublin. Back to you, Alan. Thank you. You're on mute, Alan. Oh, thank you, thank you, Michael, for that very useful insight. And we're going to share the short clip from Tim Costello's uh, documentary showing the celebrations after the flight.
So after that um, short video, we now fly you over to Germany again, and we're delighted to have another German connection with this evening's proceedings. The original aircraft of Bremen was located in the Ford Museum in Michigan, USA for many years before it was repatriated to its hometown Bremen in North Germany, where it resides today in the foyer of the Bremen airport. Key to its repatriation were Professor Dr. Bernd Hampscher, secretary, and Dr. Jens Peterson of the group called Wir holen die Bremen nach Bremen. We would like to welcome Professor Hamisher and Dr. Peterson, who would like to say a few words. Well, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me from Germany. I'm very happy to see all of you because our idea is to connect people with the airplane, especially with the Bremen. So we follow Hugo Junkers with his idea. And now, we are happy to see all some new pictures, especially from New York. I've never seen these movies before. Thank you for that. And now we have a new idea to have connection to you because the Irish ambassador, His Excellency Nicholas O'Brien, uh, want to visit us, but uh, on behalf of Corona, uh, we didn't take this uh, this time. Well, this time didn't work because we, the idea is to have St. Patrick's Day in Bremen, in the Bremen Halle. And the idea is we had greened the Bremen. Teddy, you know the pictures I showed you. The Bremen is green and uh, Fitzmaurice even is green in the front. And if you want to see this party, we have to organize that with the ambassador. And I'm happy to see our Botschafterin, Papotze, here. It, perhaps we join this in a big party. So no more things are going on in this time because the whole, the Bremen Halle is closed at this moment for the public. But our ideas are going on we often have questions to show the Bremen. Uh, they want to write stories about that. They want to make films of that. I even was part with the Bremen in a quiz show. And if you want to know the questions they ask, uh, <clears throat> the first question was, what did these pilots do? Did they break the sound barrier? Did they land in the South Pole or did they want you know what they're doing? And imagine not everyone made the right answer. So we have a lot of things to do to do to give this right answer around the world. So thank you for that. Perhaps Ben will say a few words to this situation now. Okay. Good good evening and um, uh, Greetings from me as well, from uh, Bremen. I'm a secretary of this association. Uh, I'm glad, thank you for this invitation. I'm, I'm glad to join this your event. It's very impressive as Jens already said. I'm really impressed to see you all again, Ellen and Teddy and Michael and Ralph and Catherine, because uh, we have done a lot together in the past uh, and we have done a lot of joint cooperation in on this uh, Fitzmaurice uh, Hünefeld Köln uh, event. This was in 2003, where uh, we had a joint event on the 75th anniversary, where Ralph James and Volker Schmidt departed from Baldonnel to um, uh, further down uh, to, to uh, again second time to Green Island and concurrently at the same time we organized um, a big party at the town hall uh, for uh, Bremen where your ambassador uh, Patrick Murphy attended uh, as well. The second joint event was uh, two, two and a half years again in 2018 where they had a, a 19th um, uh, anniversary where uh, uh, a delegation from you came to Bremen to attend our event. And I had the pleasure and honor 
to join your event in October then uh, to give a presentation in Potlash and this. These are the moments of cooperation we would like to continue. And in two years, we have the 95th anniversary and this should be an opportunity to plan what to do when the event is 100 to, to celebrate and who should do this and how to share this and to have ideas how to organize this. This, this challenges uh, us to help you and it challenges to do it together. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Bernd, and thank you, Jens. Maybe, maybe we'll get the Bremen back to uh, Bal Donald for the 100th anniversary. Maybe that's something we could talk to alone for a <laughs> few days. You never know. There's some yeah. ideas. Uh, not so bad that idea, but Everything. hopefully we'll, it will be staying in Bremen. But we don't know what the yeah. future is going on. Exactly. We are not the owner of this Bremen. You know, it's still a lawn. And uh, the lawn is now the airport Bremen. And if there are ideas, we have to do it together. Yeah, let's but, uh, yeah. a discussion for another night. But uh, thank you very much for your input here tonight. We really appreciate you joining us. So next, uh, we'd like to recreate the flight of the Bremen for you. This was done once before for the 75th anniversary in 2003 by the Irish Air Corps, headed up then by Mr. Ralph James. Ralph is currently a non-executive director at Part M Aviation Ireland and was formerly a director at the Irish Aviation Authority. Prior to that, he was Deputy Chief of Staff Operations of the Defence Forces and is a former GOC Air Corps Major General. Uh, and Ralph is with us this evening and thank you for joining us, Ralph. The clip we're about to play now you, uh, um, is from Brendan and Louis DC's documentaries from 2018 and I'm sure you will enjoy it. I'm Ralph James. I uh, had the privilege of uh, serving in the Air Corps for 37 years before moving on to Defence Force Headquarters. And during the time of the 75th anniversary of the Bremen flight, I was General Officer Commanding the Air Corps. For that 75th anniversary, what we tried to do was try to come up with some way of commemorating it that was different, that hadn't happened before. So one of my staff recommended that James C. Fitzmaurice was the head of the Air Corps at the time he conducted the flight, you're the head of the Air Corps, you are still a qualified pilot, why don't you recreate the flight with a team? So we put the plan together, lo and behold the Department of Defence approved the plan, everybody thought it was a great idea, so serious planning then started and then we're looking at it. Obviously we weren't going to be able to do a 36 and a half hour flight on our then King Air 200, so we planned a series of events around that date, that departure time and so on. The ultimate plan of the flight was to take off 75 years to the minute after the original Bremen from Baldonnell here and to fly around Greenlee Island Lighthouse 75 years to the minute. Day before, beautiful blue skies, lovely Canadian sunshine, next day at least three feet of snow and blowing gale. So we changed the plan for the day. We went to visit two survivors who had helped recover the Bremen back 75 years before. Two elderly gentlemen who were in a hospital. Two nicer gentlemen you couldn't meet. And what is unusual, I suppose, is there were two gentlemen who had been here on the morning whom we'd had out the day before as well. Pierce Cahill and Liam Cosgrave had both been here and had both come out the previous day to our event in Baldonnell. So it was just a bit of a juxtaposition that we met two and two and actually they were like brothers, all four of them, wonderful gentlemen who would talk away. We were with one of them in his hospital um, and we were talking about, he was telling us all about what had happened he was the man who was quoted as saying, Anton, that he ran into his parents and said, there's a whale in the sky. We were talking to him and he said, well, it was about now, it was actually about this time. And literally we looked out the window, the fog cleared and we could see the island. Absolutely 75 years to the minute. To sum up, I suppose, Fitzmaurice's 
position or legacy to aviation is perhaps difficult for us to understand now given the, our ability to fly great distances with extreme accuracy. When we recreated the flight, you flew over a, a land that was same time of the year, was covered in ice and snow. It was all right for us. We knew plus or minus 10 feet where we were. They hadn't a notion where they were. So I, I think that typifies the bravery. It typifies actually what they were going into and the challenges that people have faced throughout life when they try new things. But once that was achieved, it was a major psychological break. Aircraft had already come from America to Europe, but you couldn't keep flying aeroplanes one direction. If this, this was going to work, if there was to be a service, it had to be a return service. They proved it. When their flight was actually plotted, they actually flew far further than Baldonnell to New York. Unfortunately, the weather had taken them completely off course. So they proved it could be done. And that was a major, major achievement for the time. Rolling on from that, he had the vision to look ahead when, when others weren't, where others were only trying to achieve what was there in front of them. And I think it's that spirit that then comes on and you can roll through time where uh, Foynes was set up, where Guinness Pete Aviation for leasing aircraft around the world, where Ireland now has an aviation industry that far exceeds that which we would have for an, an island nation this size. And part of that is a legacy from James C. Fitzmaurice. Ralph, that was a great uh, adventure, I would say, and also it was a great insight into how Fitzmaurice uh, impacted where we are today with aviation in Ireland. Thanks for that, and thanks for joining us. So, back to County Leash, and uh, we are enormously proud to finish off this evening with a beautiful music composition from Leash, specially composed to commemorate Fitzmaurice and the flight of the Bremen. It's called An Impossible Dream, and it's a suite of music based on the life of Colonel Fitzmaurice. Rosa Flannery is Music Development Officer at Music Generation Leash, and Martin Turish is an internationally acclaimed composer, producer, and musicologist. The video you're about to see was produced by Nisha Kettle and recorded on location in Lime Tree Airfield, pre-COVID. The music piece continues to be developed during COVID times, I will let Rosa and Martin take up the story now. How are you doing, Rosa? All good? Good, Alan. Yeah, can you? We can hear you perfectly. Yeah, and Martin, is Martin there? Yeah, yeah, here. Good stuff. Okay, oh, away you go. All the Donegal people are here now, Alan. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Hello everybody. Um, I, um, I'm just going to tell you first off a little bit about Music Generation Leash and then I'm going to pass over to Martin who is in fact now the expert on Fitzmaurice I have to say. Um, music Generation Leash is a performance music education programme for young people in the county. We were set up in 2012 and we work in schools and youth settings anywhere we can really where we can um, give young people access to music. And we also provide access to musical instruments. We're part of Leash and Offaly Education and Training Board and supported by Leash County Council. Our music programme is heavily subsidised and that makes taking part really easy. In 2016, we set up a traditional music orchestra um, or what we call a trad orchestra. The orchestra is directed by a pioneering young musician, Siobhan Buckley, and has been a resounding success since it was set up. Orchestra members from Leash and the Midlands area are dedicated, talented and absolutely music mad. They are an inspiring group of young people to work with. The orchestra have performed for many notable figures, including US President Joe Biden, although I have to say he was vice president at the time, um, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and President Michael D. Higgins. And they have also represented music generation in New York, Monaco and Spain. 
In 2016, and on multiple occasions since then, we have had the opportunity to work with the amazing composer and accordionist Martin Turish, who's here this evening. Martin's creativity and enthusiasm has been central to the development of a really vibrant youth music ensemble. In 2018, after a lot of different locations in Port Leash, we secured our own premises in Port Leash Town. Leash Music Centre is part of an overarching plan in the, in, the, in the county to develop a cultural quarter. Beside us on Church Avenue, where we're located, is the beautifully renovated Fitzmaurice Place. We decided to create a piece of music inspired by the achievements of Colonel James Fitzmaurice to celebrate our new home and connect orchestra members to the heritage of Port Leash Town itself. The project developed in partnership with Catherine Casey, Heritage Officer of Leash County Council, and Teddy Fennelly, who has already spoken this evening, local historian, and I suppose I would call him a Fitzmaurice fanatic. This project has been supported by Creative Ireland Leash as part of the Creative Ireland Programme 2017 to 2021. And the film element that you will see this evening was supported by the Leash Arts Office for Culture Night 2020. The Impossible Dream film was directed by Nisha Kettle and tells the story of the development of this new suite of music to date. Um, Nisha Kettle is also from Wolf Wilfill and County Leash, and I'm proud to say as a member of our trad orchestra, Nisha is currently studying filmmaking in IADT in Dublin. The music in this video was composed and performed by Martin Turish and the Music Generation Leash Trad Orchestra members. The music was recorded and mixed by Martin Turish in the Dunamay's Arts Centre, Port Leash, and we filmed, as was already mentioned, on location in Lime Tree Airfield in County Leash. So I'm now going to pass you over to Martin Turish to speak a little more about this newly composed suite of music, The Impossible Dream. As you already know, Martin is from Donegal and is now based in Dublin and Donegal people are taking over the world. That's true. We're going to push all these, all these Cork people out of the, out of the water. Um, Martin performs all over the world with the Donegal band Alton and he has released several albums, solo albums and has collaborated on countless others. And Martin has obtained a PhD um, in music from the DIT Conservatory of Music and Jap Drama. So over to you, Martin. <laughs> well, thanks a million, Rosa, and thanks a million to everyone as well. It's been just a, an honor and a joy to hear and see so much wonderful um, material on, on a figure uh, that I have absolutely come to adore and indeed be absolutely obsessed by. And it's great to join you on what Fitz called Destiny Day, April 12th, um, when they were to go to either heaven or New York. And uh, Greenly Island was uh, better, <laughs> I think, anyhow for it. So I suppose I'll, I'll be very quick because I, I'm conscious of the time. And uh, so really the job of the composer as such is um, it's to try and translate the, the various aspects of what happened, to try to find the human aspect behind it and translate it into, a, into how it felt, to capture how various aspects of the story felt. And so very, very quickly, uh, movement one is, uh, it's about the fascination with the sky, uh, the fascination of flight, which of course goes back millennia. Um, you know, even Leonardo da, Vin da Vinci had his uh, flying machine, um, as well as having designed an accordion, um, not, neither of which were built. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, um, it, it captures Fitz's time in Port Leash and uh, his time working on the, the monoplane. Uh, of the Aldrets, um, after which um, the local clergyman uh, spoke from the altar saying, if God had intended man to fly, he would have given him wings. So that was so the, the, end of, uh, the end of the dream, uh, just for that particular point. Uh, the second movement then um, is, 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 is relates to Fitz's time in World War I, uh, particularly around the Battle of the Somme. And Fitz was very young at the time. He, he managed to run away to the army before he was of the legal age. His parents had to produce his birth certificate and take him out of it, but he managed to get his way back in again. And why this is, is important is um, because it's, it's where the motivation, I think, uh, comes from. Um, and, and what would motivate somebody to do, to take part in, a, in, a, in an event which was clearly so... Uh, 
you know, I mean, it, nobody had survived it, I suppose it's fair to say. And uh, within the Battle of the Somme, um, you know, it's important to note that Fitz's, Fitz's uh, regiment went in with 850 soldiers. They came out with 21. And these are people that Fitz knew. When you read the read Teddy's wonderful book or the, the Three Musketeers of the Air, you know, I, the stories he tells about the, you know, about um, he's, he's talking to uh, his comrades and his friends in mid-conversation. Fitz hears the sound of the whistles and, and, the, uh, and the bombs coming. His friends don't. Um, and, you know, it's, he experiences a huge amount of suffering and witnesses a huge amount of would be the absolute opposite of humanity um, as such. And there's a few lines that Fitz wrote um, that Teddy has in his book that I want to share with you. Um, so this is sort of really where the basis of Movement 2 comes from. Of course, I try to portray the, the horror of the war, but it ends, Movement 2 ends with a piece called Courage. And um, Fitz writes, page 60 of, of, of Teddy's book, um, the acts of courage, self-sacrifice and endurance, which one witnessed were beyond belief. Yet I had seen men whose spirits became broken under such soul searing tests, executed for cowardice, deserting the line or for deliberately wounding themselves to get away from it all. To shoot a man on the spot whose nerve had broken in order to prevent a complete collapse of morale along the line was understandable to subject him to the humiliation and gross indignity of a trial by court-martial on a charge carrying the penalty of capital punishment was indecent, inhumane and utterly savage. Under such a system, a soldier could win a Victoria Cross for sublime courage and self-sacrifice one day and be shot for cowardice the following day. And then his definition of courage. In, a, in the test of battle, every normal man is not only frightened, he's almost petrified with fear. The greater the imagination, the greater the degree of fear suffered. Courage is nothing more than the conquest and suppression of fear or the development of a degree of willpower which is capable of rising to such supreme heights. It is sustained by a high standard of discipline. And this will start to become, the, the, the uh, relevance of that uh, starts to become apparent then uh, when we move to movement three. Um, there's only four, so... Um, movement three is called the Princess Xenia, and uh, that was the plane Fitz used in his first transatlantic attempt, so prior to the Bremen. And even just with the name Xenia, we start to get a sense of what this is all about, what, what this whole mission is about. Uh, Xenia comes from the Greek practice of theosity, uh, which is the practice of being kind to strangers or people that you don't know, um, lest they be a god in disguise, testing how good you are. Um, uh, its opposite then is xenophobia. Um, so it's about a warmth and friendliness and uh, kindness uh, to people and an attempt to understand different people and different cultures. And so we try to capture that in Movement 3. You'll hear a little snippet of it shortly. You'll hear, ask, you'll hear a Balkan, for any musicians, uh, you'll hear a, a, that it's in a Balkan rhythm, Eastern European rhythm in uh, 1116. Uh, you'll hear some Ravelli in harmony. Uh, you'll hear some even aspects of techno. There's a, there's a whole range of different cultural, even a bit of beatboxing from Dale in there. Uh, a whole host of different styles uh, thrown in, in along there. Uh, and of course, then all of this leads up to Destiny Day. And uh, Destiny Day, then the 12th of April, um, when, when all of this happened and the, the piece of music itself, it covers, I found a log book for the flight online and it covers each, each, each happening, uh, each part as it happens. And, and the drama of all of that. Um, but, you know, whenever they landed on, on the other side, I mean, we got a sense earlier on of the ticker tape parade and the excitement, and you can see how they were represented in music and pictures, all of the rest of it. And um, I mean, I, it's funny, you know, a part of me just thought of the of, of the film Brooklyn, which I'm sure you've seen, it's a, it's a recent enough film. And you, you see just how difficult it is for people to get from here uh, over to the States, you know, something that's so simple for us now. And it's ironic, just in the Three Musketeers of the Air, I think that was published in 1928, I, I can be corrected if I'm wrong. And, uh, you know, Fitz des describes, you know, as they make their way over the Atlantic, he's imagining, he describes basically how, what, what I would experience getting on a flight to New York, New York you know, right now. Um, 
you know, these great large planes, somebody would be serving the food. Um, he's, he's a pretty accurately mapped out. It's, I mean, you really sort of do have to almost, uh, almost, check, the, almost check the dates and that that's the, the, the Three Musketeers. It's a, it's a wonderful old book. Um, but getting to the whole point of it all. So it, it gave people hope that you could see your family again after being separated from them. You see in that film, just how difficult it is to get home if something goes wrong. Um, you know, that you could just move over and back. And I think that um, the, the whole point of the play of, of, of the journey is beautifully captured up in the Three Musketeers of the Air that was written by Captain Cole, um, but has contributions from all three. Um, and I'll just read out this, um, the, the, this, this, this bit of text. Um, the history of civilization and progress has been based to a tremendous extent upon the development of communication and transportation. Misunderstanding becomes more and more difficult when our neighbors are brought closer home to us by the rapid communication of ideas, thoughts, and motives which go to make up the traditions of that country. The airplane will be a tremendous factor in bringing about a universal peace. It is not hard to realize that many years ago when a hundred miles seemed a formidable distance, suspicion and greed and hatred were allowed to run rife. As the feudal systems of the old world give way to, gave way to nationalism, so will nationalism give way to universalism when our systems of communication are perfected to a degree that we are all bound together with a common understanding. And it's funny, you know, whereas it, it, prior to the COVID pandemic, it might have been hard for us to understand this, this idea you know, but um, as of today, we're allowed to go more than five kilometers, so we can um, we can appreciate things a bit more. And um, you know, if you listen to some of the older Irish music, uh, "Raggle Taggle Gypsy" or by Planksty, um, and there's many other variants of the same song, you can see that there was there was always a suspicion of people that were only just down the road in modern terms. And uh, of course, now we very much appreciate the way the world, the way that we're able to use technology to to do something like this in these times and uh, you know the way that we can just get on a plane in normal times of course and you know we we we've friends all over the world we it's i think that what fitz was describing a, a lot of it has has come through basically he he was he was just a man way 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 uh, ahead of his time and uh, that's really what the piece is trying to is trying to capture um but i know that uh, talking about music is a bit like dancing about architecture. So I think that you should probably hear some. And um, so you're gonna hear just a little snippet from um, Movement uh, 3 and uh, listen out for those, uh, all of the different uh, cultural aspects in there and the different styles. Thank you, Martin. And now, uh, which uh, small piece of uh, the composition I wanna share with you. They were flying in zero visibility, in the dark. Even the attempt of making the journey east to west across the Atlantic had been banned by most countries. Anyone who had previously tried it had died. Midway, going across the Atlantic, they can see very threatening thunder clouds uh, in front of them. And they know that there's no way of really navigating around it. So the only option in this tiny little aircraft is to go through it. It's described so vividly. Um, the winds and the, the winds pushing this little plane down in towards the water. He, all he can see is the, the the white foam of the waves crashing up, and he likened it to the the, the the white icy fingers of death trying to pull them down into the watery tombs. I'm Martin Turish and I'm working with the wonderful music generation Lee Strad Orchestra to compose a piece called The Impossible Dream. It celebrates the life of Colonel James Fitzmaurice. James Fitzmaurice was one of the pioneers of Irish aviation and indeed world aviation. He was born in Dublin in 1898 and moved to Port Leash when he was four but spent all of his formative years in Port Leash. excited to reconnect with Martin Tourish 
I'm working a new musical commission dedicated to James Fitzmaurice, who was this pioneering aviator from Port Leash who was involved in the first transatlantic flight from east to west in 1928. So it seems really fitting that we should be involved in some sort of a commemoration of his achievements, a musical commemoration of his achievements. Fitz was underage when he ran away to join the army. When he was 18, he was standing there at the Battle of the Somme. There were 850 people in Fitz's regiment, and out of that, 21 people survived, of which Fitz was one. He had this incredible fascination with flight of all sorts. It was the experience of being in the Battle of the Somme. This, this is where the whole ambition came from, trying to change aircraft from flying coffins and to the messengers of death that they were known as into messengers of peace and this way of bringing the world together. I think what's, what's quite different about what Music Generation Leash and our Trad Orchestra do is that we're working with a composer to create a piece of music in a really collaborative way and as a result of that the young people have a really strong sense of ownership of the music so um, to, to be part of those musical performances then even as an audience you can get a sense of that emotional connection to the music and it's kind of a heightened experience for everybody involved. When we went into lockdown, I think everybody, including myself, thought that everything <laughs> had stopped and everything was over. But it was the most inspiring aspect to get a call from Rosa to figure out ways in which we actually might be able to connect. And suddenly, I, I couldn't believe it, that our orchestra went from having about 15 members to, to about 70 of the most talented, incredible young musicians across Ireland. Morris's ideas was that through aviation and pioneering work in aviation that the world would open up by people understanding people from other cultures we wouldn't have as, as much warfare in the world and I guess our own experience during lockdown was that we were you know isolated we weren't allowed to travel this project has just opened up so many possibilities and so many impossibilities and for us it has really become our impossible dream Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed that. I think it is a great demonstration of what's possible in these COVID times. And it also so shows you how young people can get inspired by aviation as well, the same as Fitzmaurice was back in Port Leach in the day. You also see there in the background, uh, Lion Tree Airport. Leash has its own airport, believe it or not. I'm sure Fitz would be very proud of that today. And uh, Jerry Deegan, who's the owner out there, outside of Vimo, would love to see visitors when we can travel again. And it's a fantastic facility he has out there. Thank you very much to Rosa and to Martin. I think it's a fantastic story. And uh, <coughs> you really are um, helping music and aviation and leash all at the one time. So on that note, uh, we could not sign off without having some final closing remarks from the man himself, Teddy Fenley. And this time in full Technicolor. We've sorted out the bugs in the video, and Teddy uh, has, uh, after Teddy has concluded, we will open the floor to questions that have come in on the chat forum and from the Facebook Live broadcast. This will be hosted by Catherine Casey, another diligent committee member, and who is also Heritage Officer at Leash County Council. Mm -hmm. uh, you're welcome to stay on the Zoom link to chat with the presenters or other audience members after the Q&A session. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Teddy for the final remarks. Thanks, Alan.
uh, well, it was a blessing in disguise, I suppose, for everybody that you couldn't see me the first time round. <laughs> but however, I won't delay you too long at this stage. Anyway, I know that the night is, uh, is, 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 is long. Uh, the story of the Bremen flight uh, and its rescue from Greenlee Island, um, along with the crew, it was branded one of the greatest stories of the century by the media of the time. And the three intrepid aviators were fated as conquering heroes throughout the world. The New York Times headlined the story for 19 days out of 21. New York is famous for its parades and there never was a bigger parade there or in the 10 other American cities they had visited than that given to the three musketeers of the air, the two Germans and an Irishman. Two million people lined up the streets of New York and over 10,000 soldiers, as was mentioned earlier, from crack American Army and Marine Corps regiments marched in the parade. In Washington, D.C., the aviators were presented with distinguished flying crosses by U.S. President Calvin Coolidge, the first non-Americans to receive the honor. They were later met freemen of the city of Dublin. Remember that in 1928, independent Ireland was only six years old, still suffering from a lack of identity and striving to establish itself among the nations of the world. Fitzmaurice proudly carried his country's tricolour on the flight, which is now in the safekeeping of the Irish Air Corps, as we heard earlier, and proudly wore his Irish army uniform wherever he went. He was the dashing young hero of the hour and by projecting his country to the fore in the glamorous world of aviation, he presented the best possible image of the new Ireland. Has anybody ever done more to instill a sense of confidence in his newly independent country or help put Ireland on the international stage in such dramatic and positive light? Ralph James has reminded us of the legacy he has left to his country. Thanks to Fitzmaurice and his legacy, Ireland has always punched well above its weight in the field of aviation. True, he is celebrated by the Air Corps and by his many admirers, but it is, is it not time to give him the honour he is due, that of a national hero? I suggest, and I am fully aware that I am not the first to do so, that Dublin International Airport, or at least one of its terminals, should be called after Colonel Fitzmaurice. Is there anyone out there this evening who supports this proposal? Or should I say, is there anybody out there who would not support this proposal? I would like to thank all our contributors, the organizing committee and all of you who joined us this evening to mark the 93rd anniversary of the flight of the Bremen. Thank you and good evening. Have we descend. If anybody on Zoom or Facebook has any questions, I will provide answers as best I can. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy. I know that uh, one of the first people that wants to come in is, is Porik Fleming. He wants to say a few words because Porik was in Bremen the time of the, uh, of the visit there from Leash County Council. And he was Carhealock at the time. Porik, are you able to unmute yourself there? Or Louise, can you help Porik unmute maybe? There you okay. go. There you I go. think I'm okay there. But yeah. look, at, I just say a few words because so much has been said tonight. It's absolutely fantastic what, I, what I've seen here uh, to, to, to tonight. And why I want to, I've been following Teddy and his story and all the people involved in this for many years. But I was lucky enough and honored enough that in 2018, literally this time, this time three years ago, uh, Teddy, Catherine Casey, uh, Paddy Boogie, and Brendan DC and my, myself were over in Bremen. And it's great to see Brita and Bird there. Delighted to see you, you looked after us so well. But look at everything, so much has been said and a lot more said. So I'm not going to repeat anything that's been said earlier by the fantastic speakers. Alan, great credit to you in moving this forward. I've met you a few times before. And all I want to say is well done to everybody. This is great. I agree, Teddy, with your suggestion. 
for the future for one of the terminals in Dublin Airport, and we'll have to follow up that. But look at, uh, we were over in Bremen to honour, to celebrate the 90th anniversary. It was absolutely fantastic. But just maybe the perspective I, come, I would have come home with, the German people, Germany, and all the people, there was hundreds of people there in that hangar uh, of, at Bremen Airport, where they have a special museum. The plane is restored. And we got up and we looked into it and we were lifted up. And it was fabulous to see how three men could tr cross the Atlantic in such a small space. They were unbelievably brave men. Uh, but I equally have to credit our friends here from Germany who, and the German people who keep that story alive because it was uh, some historical event. So look, at all I'm trying to say is I was honoured, I was lucky to be in Bremen with other Leash people celebrating that uh, 90th anniversary. And obviously you have big plans for the 100th anniversary. So I, I just kind of finished there only say well done to everybody. Also, well done to Music Generation, Rosa and Martin. Uh, I'll tell you what, you give me a different understanding of music. I had some understanding up to now, but you give me more in depth than I maybe had before now. But well done to your team and, and, and well done to everybody. But uh, it's a great night. And it, at one stage, there was over 120 listening in today. So look, I leave it like that. I just want to be brief Thanks and I can, give yeah. us any support you can, we will in the future. Okay. Thank you very much indeed for that. I'd like to ask Catherine Casey to come on now for a minute or two. Uh, she really has put in a lot of work into this project as well, and she's been watching in the background. Uh, I'm not sure if you see any questions coming in, Catherine, or would you like to say a few words? Um, I think most of what people wanted to ask was, was kind of answered. There's an awful lot of compliments for yourself, Alan, for Teddy, um, for Music Generation and for Martin. Um, and for all the other speakers. So everybody seems to have really enjoyed the evening. Um, I'm not sure, does anybody else want to raise their hand if they'd like to speak um, or if they'd like to, to, to ask a question or maybe we can leave it um, and people who can get in touch at any later stage. Um, I'd like to thank on my own behalf, all of the group that were involved this evening. I think you'll all agree it's been a fantastic evening. Um, all the speakers this evening and um, Louise, Cahala and Aoife Phelan who've been helping in the background as well with all the technical stuff. Um, well done to everybody. Thanks so much to all of our speakers. The presentation is, is going out live on Facebook, so it will remain as a Facebook video. If anybody wants to look back over it or to tell anybody who missed it, it's there on the Fits and the Famous Flight Facebook page, and it will remain there if anybody wants to watch back over it. Um, and I think uh, I'll pass, you back, pass it back to you, to you, Alan, at that stage. Thanks. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, so it just uh, remains with me to thank everybody uh, for helping with this amazing project and, and night tonight. Our visitors from Germany, um, our, people, our, our, our speakers from, from the Air Corps, Tim Costello, Liam Bourne for his fantastic collection, Michael Parsons for his input, uh, and Ralph uh, for that fantastic uh, view of, of, the, of the flight. And not to mention, uh, not to forget, I should say, Music Generation Leash. I'm going to play one final little clip here now. Again, uh, we'll try and share the screen with you. This concludes, and I think this short little clip uh, um, encapsulates what Fitzmaurice is all about. So on that note, we'll say good night. We'll leave it open. If anybody wants to hang around for a chat, we'll see how that works. Um, but I just want to play this clip and after that we'll say good night and we'll leave it open for a chat.